This is Profit from the Inside with Joel Block. Strategies to give your business the inside track. And now, here's your host, Joel Block. You ever wonder what the trick is to building the best teams? I mean the best teams. And the best teams on the planet are generally found in athletics. So to share that uh, with us is former number one defensive shot blocker with the Utah Jazz, Mark Eaton. Mark, welcome. Thanks, Joel. Great to be with you today. Hey, man. How are you? I'm doing great. Hey, good. So um, just give us a quick background. You you have a very distinguished uh, career as an athlete, uh, and uh, we'll talk about some other stuff uh, later, but uh, tell us a little bit about some of the accomplishments that you had on the court. You're, uh, they, they were extraordinary. Well, I played with the Utah Jazz for 12 seasons and um, positioned myself as a defensive player and ended up leading the NBA in block shots uh, four times and being defensive player of the year twice and still hold a couple of NBA records for most blocks in a single season and career average and um, and even made it as an all-star one year. And and that's all pretty amazing. And, and what's especially amazing is that uh, you didn't start out in athletics, right? You weren't like a high school basketball star that rec- got recruited into the NBA. No, I was not. I, uh, I, I grew up in Southern California and and uh, played on the team in high school, but sat on the end of the bench and wasn't very good. And and even though at that time I was six eleven or so, uh, the coaches really didn't know what to do with me. I didn't know what to do with me. And at the end of my senior year, I really didn't have any options to do anything else athletically. And so I decided it's time to time to get a job. And uh, a friend of mine was going to trade school in Arizona, and, and I'd grown up in a in a home where my father was a, a vocational educator and and a diesel mechanic, and spent most of his time working on boats in the L.A. Harbor. And so that was my that was what I did on Saturdays was handed him wrenches and made gaskets and things like that. And so uh, a friend was going to automotive trade school in Arizona and he said, Hey, why don't you come out with me and we'll, we'll learn to be auto mechanics. I said, oh, that sounds good as anything else. And so well, I did that for a year and, and then came back to Southern California and, and got fired from my first job and wound up in a tire store in Buena Park and worked there about a year and a half when a junior college coach came around the corner and saw me standing out there at seven, four talking to this little customer and, about the break job and hang, hang on you know you, 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 you kind of you kind of glossed over that you know <laughs> seven foot four inches tall right that's uh yep. i mean i'm six two and, and i'm usually among the taller people in the room and when i stand next to you it, it it's um, I, I come up to uh you know not even your shoulders i mean it's it's <laughs> bizarre it's a bizarre experience so because i don't want anybody to think it's 704 in the morning or something <laughs> No, no, seven foot four. That's, that's me. And, uh, anyway, so I was working at this tire store, and this and this guy who was a coach stopped in and and started harassing me about playing basketball, which everybody did uh, when you're seven four. They immediately sure, hey, sure. that's what you should be doing with your life. Um, and uh, but over a period of visits, he said, you know, I know some things about playing basketball as a big guy. You probably don't know. And uh, he said, if you'd be willing to come out with me one evening, uh, let me show you a couple of things. Um, you know, let's just, let, let's see if that's something you'd be interested in. And, and it took him a long time to convince me. I was very reluctant to, uh, to, to go back in that arena again, because it was something I'd failed at miserably in high school. I didn't want to recreate that experience. <laughs> so, uh, <laughs> but, but eventually he, uh, we got together and, and he started showing me these things that big guys could do on the basketball court that I'd never really heard of before and showed me basketball from a different perspective, one that I wasn't uh, familiar with. And it was intriguing enough to where I said, okay, I'll, you know, I'll just, I'll try this for a little while and see what happens. And so I just worked out with him in the evenings. And I think what impressed me most was he was committed to being there for me every day. He really didn't want anything from me. He just simply wanted to show me what he had learned uh, from his background as of working with big guys and, um, and see if it was of interest to me. And, and it was a little rough getting started, but um, eventually I decided to go back to junior college and uh, spent two years there. At, uh, it was called Cypress College, uh, just down the street. And uh, my coach, Tom Lubin, was the assistant coach. He um, he worked with me and continued to work with me. And I spent two years there and eventually uh, went on to UCLA after that. And spent two years on the bench at UCLA. That was a, not, not the greatest career there either, but uh, somehow managed to work my way into the NBA uh, and spent 12 years there. Well, I'll tell you, it's, it's, it's amazing. And what, what stands out the most for me about your story 
is that you were kind of going down, uh, you know, a rather blue collar path of uh, auto mechanic, boat mechanic, and and somebody came into your life and you took a hard left turn and, and everything changed for you. Uh, and, and I like to focus on that for a second because that doesn't happen to everybody. I mean, not everybody's going down one path and then take a hard left turn. Um, did you recognize at the time that this guy had come into your life and, and you know, what was happening and what was possible? Or do you only see that in retrospect? Um, you know, I, I think looking back on it, uh, I, I always wondered what I was supposed to be doing with my life. And I, and I, and I think working in the, in the automotive world, there was a part of me that said, okay, this is all right for right now, but there's something else out there. I didn't know what it was, um, but I just had that little inkling or feeling. And there was something about uh, the way Tom positioned it and how he approached me that I was at least willing to give it a try. And I didn't know where it would go. Neither of us did. You know, it was just something uh, I said, well, I'll just, I'll just mess around with this. I can still go back and be a mechanic if I want to. Uh, and see and see what happens. So I, I guess there was just some kind of a little knowing within me that I that I paid attention to. But but did that did that thing come from your family where your family said, "Hey, listen, there, there's more to life than what you're doing," or did it just come from inside? No, no, no. My family was uh, supportive of whatever I wanted to do. I mean, um, uh, you know, my father was not an athlete growing up. He always just worked, and even though he was six nine, and and um, and so. Uh, I think it was just more me of, of it was a combination of, of me thinking, well, maybe I'll give it a try and the combination of somebody who really seemed to know what a big guy could do on the basketball court, you know, at seven, four versus, uh, you know, a player who was six foot, that there was some distinctive things that I could do that would help my team out there on the court that, um, that I'd never really heard of before. Well, uh, so that opens up a whole other discussion, and that is that there are people who know things that other people don't know. And, you know, and and this applies to businesses, it applies to everything, that uh, we're all marching down a certain path, and then there are people who just see the world in a different way. Mm -hmm. Uh, And and that happens at every single level. So, uh, you know, when when you ran into this guy, and this guy, uh, you know, knew something that you didn't know, uh, were you defensive about it? Were you pretty open-minded about it? I mean, how were you? Well, I think initially I was defensive only because, as I said, everybody that came into the tire store where I worked told me I should be playing basketball. Now, I don't run around telling everybody else what they should be doing with their life, and it really frustrated me and irritated me that at 19 years old or 20 years old, people were coming to me and, say, to me and saying, hey, you should be playing for the Lakers. You should be doing this. You should be doing that. I'm like, wait a minute. I don't run around telling everybody else what they should be doing. <laughs> uh, but when you're a bigger guy, there is something that um, stimulates a conversation with when people see you or encounter you where they immediately think they should start getting into your business. And um, so, um, so this guy, initially, I, I, you know, I was reluctant very reluctant at first to even think about it. In fact, I sent the guy packing more than once. Um, but he kind of kept coming back. He's like, you know, I know some things. And he, he brought me a pair of shoes and he had another coach stop by. He had a former, they had a current NBA player, a guy by the name of Swen Nader stopped by, who was somebody he'd worked with. And um, through a combination of all those things, I finally said, okay, you know, for 30 minutes, I'll try it and see what he has to say. And, and, um, um, and once he showed me a few things, it was, it was definitely intriguing, but again, probably the, the bigger factor was that he said, look, if you want to work out with me, let me show you these things. Let me teach you for a little while. He said, I'll be here every morning to meet you or every evening, whatever you want. And, um, and I'll, and I'll, I'll work with you. And I'd never really experienced that before where, I, where someone said, look, I'll just be here right next to you and I'll show you what you need to do. And again, he didn't want anything from me. He wasn't like an agent trying to sign me or anything like that. I mean, I was rough. Um, but he said, look, I'll, I'll show you these things that I know that you could, at a minimum, get a college scholarship for uh, if, you, if you're willing to work at it a little bit. And uh, so, you know, that's, that was the intriguing part where I said, okay, I'll, you know, it, it was a minimal risk for me at the time just to work out with him in the afternoons after I got off work. And said, well, I'll do this for a few months and see what happens. So this guy uh, gave a lot to you. Have you in your career or in your life uh, found any uh, young people to uh, do the same thing to, you know, pay it forward to them in a, 
in a in a pretty uh, you know you know I, I think in a different way. in a different manner. Um, I mean, I was always tried to help people wherever I could. I've never really became a, a basketball coach, but I think in my certainly in my speaking career, um, being able to share some of those stories, uh, I, I think inspires other people because. Um, Sometimes we're not open to the help that is around us and the people that are there, and uh, and so I think through my the telling of my story, at least people are open to the possibility that maybe something could be different or something could change if I was willing to be a little more coachable or listen listen to other people or you know like you talked about, there's other people out there that know stuff that you don't know, and and maybe I should just. Uh, you know, let my guard down a little bit and, and be slightly more vulnerable and, and listen to what other people have to say. Maybe I might learn something. You know, this, uh, this show is always about, uh, you know, what's the trick. I, I always mm-hmm. think that there's a trick that successful people have, and I'm not talking about a magic trick or anything that's fictitious, but there are things, there are patterns, there are activities that successful people do. And I just uh, can't help it, but think that, you know, you were open-minded to somebody who came along, um, uh, now, maybe not the first time because you'd heard it a thousand times from other people, but there were things that, that the guy did, the coach, that got you to soften up. And then there were things that you did that got you to take your life in a new direction. So, I mean, those are cool things. And I think that everybody who listens could benefit from those kinds of, uh, of activities, from those kinds of attitudes. And, and it's really critical. So, let's talk about the trick because uh, you, you ended up becoming one of the most, uh, highly regarded players in the NBA during your, your career. And you played with some of the luminaries of, of the sport, you know, in, uh, in the eighties. Right. I mean, that's uh, you know, that you, you had a, the Utah jazz was an extraordinary team at that time. And, you know, what was the trick in your opinion to being a successful athlete in, in a, in, in the world of basketball at that time? I think uh, the, the trick was not quitting, um, even when it looked like things weren't going well, and and having that coach who was willing to talk to me. So as I mentioned, I had two pretty good years in junior college. I go to UCLA, I'm sitting on the bench, and things aren't going well. And and my junior college coach said, you know, look, I, I know it's not going well right now, but this isn't about this year or next year. This is about playing it out and seeing if we can get a job playing basketball, whether it's overseas in the NBA somewhere. And um, he said, you know, if you're not going to play in the games, you're going to have to make the practices your games. You're going to be the first guy there and the last to leave. You're going to have to continue to do the running and go, go to the weight room, et cetera. Um, because I'm telling you, if you continue to do that, when you finish your collegiate career, you will have an opportunity to try out at something at the next level. And so I think the trick there was continuing to work and improve my own skills because because when I would whine or complain about not playing at UCLA, he said, you know, it's not the coach, it's not the team. Tom would say, it's you. You know, you have to get better. You've got to be a better player. He said, you've, you've stepped it up to another level now, and the, the other players are a lot quicker and faster, and so you've got to pick up your game. And that's kind of what kept me going, and I just decided I was going to play it out. I said, I don't know where this is going to go, what it's going to do, um, but I'm going to, I'm, I'm at UCLA, I might as well spend the two years here, figure out what I can do, and then and then from there, if it doesn't work out, great. I've, I can still be an auto mechanic. I can do whatever other thing, <laughs> um, which is kind of silly when you know people laugh at that sometimes. But um, but that's how that's how my brain worked. And um, so uh, I just decided I was going to keep going until all options ran out. And uh, if I finished at UCLA and there was there was no option of of playing basketball further beyond that, then I, I was okay with that. And so I think that was the, that was the trick. Um, it was the, this, the, the not quitting and the continuing to play out all the options. I think sometimes in business, we, you, know, you get frustrated because this doesn't work and that's not working. But there are things that you can still do that will give you a, a leg up or a, a chance, uh, at least to be in the game. And that's all I was looking for. There are so many people in our society that um, – they just give up. I mean, they, they, you know, I mean, I, I, I really, I just, you know, I, I, I'm interested to understand where it comes from inside of a person because there are so many people in our society that, that just give up their, uh, I don't know, they, they just don't have the internal fortitude to, you know, keep going and press forward and, you know, things are tough. They don't like me. I'm not good enough. And then they end up, you know, going on to something else and then they end up being miserable for the next many years. So, you know, what, what do you say to somebody that, you know, that kind of wakes up in the morning and, 
you know, it's probably not a leader of a company, but it, it certainly is going to be somebody who's in the rank and file that just can't seem to get to the next level. And they just kind of, I don't know, they're not feeling good about themselves. Any, any advice? I, uh, I, I just, I caution people that they think success is going to be instantaneous. And we live in the world of instant gratification now, right? All the knowledge we need is right at our fingertips, but we're, you know, at the same time, it's so much information and we don't, uh, it's hard to comprehend it all. And I think we do a poor job preparing our young people to understand the ups and the downs that come along with the journey. Um, You know, I just finished reading uh, Phil Knight's book, Shoe Dog, which is a great book, about his struggles getting Nike going. I mean, you're constantly on the edge of going out of business for for more than a decade. And uh, that's what it takes. It takes that perseverance, it's that willingness to go for broke, it's that willingness to to do whatever it takes day in and day out. Uh, and, and I think that um, a lot of the, the especially the younger generation sometimes think, well, I hit the first brick wall, it hurt, hit, hit the first hurdle. And they're like, well, that's it. It's not going to work. And, and I think it's through the telling of stories of athletes or the telling of stories of other successful people. If, you, if we can share those more with uh, the next generation, then they, I think they have a better understanding of like, okay, this is just a temporary setback. You know, my vision's still clear. I know where I'm trying to go, and I just need to stay at it. Uh, I, I think we we spend a lot of time telling people what not to do. We don't spend a lot of t- time t- telling people what to do. I think that's the difference right now. Well, that's probably because a lot of people don't know what to do. There's probably not a lot of uh, people that are in a position to know. And, you know, it just it, it feels to me like um, – an awful lot of people, uh, you know, walk around and thinking other people are lucky. And what they don't understand is how much work they did and how much perseverance. I mean, having uh, been in the startup business for years in venture capital, I mean, I know that the, the one out of 10,000 businesses that, that goes to the moon, uh, it's not a coincidence that that happens. I mean, there's a little bit of market forces, and a little bit of luck that sure. causes everything to move forward, but that the amount of energy it takes to tee something up to make it happen. So let's talk about, um, Let's talk about the trick to being successful as an athlete. So you talked about the, the trick about perseverance of how you got to, uh, you know, eventually be an, an athlete or have the opportunity to really go to that level. But when you finally got to play and you really were, you know, part of a team, and I know you've written a whole book on this. I've heard you speak. Uh, you're a terrific speaker. You're an engaging speaker. Uh, I personally love listening to the stories of athletes. I just think that athletics, especially professional athletics at the highest level is uh, is the greatest metaphor for business and for life, but, which is really the thing that I like about it the most is that great metaphor. So what's the trick to being successful uh, on a team, uh, you know, as, as part of an organization? You know, what are the things that you have to do? Well, I, I think the first thing is that you have to understand that once you quote unquote make it like to the NBA, for instance, that that is just the beginning of another process. It's not, you know, I finally made it kind of a thing. And I, I came into the NBA with an understanding that, you know, I wasn't as athletic as a lot of the other players. I was a big guy and I I had a certain purpose out there on the floor. Um, But um, at the same time, I knew that I would have to continue to work and get stronger because the players were so much quicker and faster and bigger than I had played, but played against at the previous level. Uh, So that was a, that was a part of it. And then, um, and then I think really honing in on the one thing that I could do well to benefit my team. Uh, sometimes guys come into the NBA and they think, okay, you know, I can shoot, I can do this, I can do all these things. And, and they don't understand the concept of being a member of a team. Uh, and so I spent time with the coaches. I, I, you know, I learned a valuable lesson from Wilt Chamberlain one afternoon at UCLA about not running around trying to catch all the quicker, faster players, but to park my rear end underneath the basket, that that was something I could be good at and defend and stop players from getting to the basket. And, and I said, okay, that's one thing I can do well. And, um, and I focused on that when I came to the NBA. And fortunately, the Utah Jazz at that time were a bad market or a bad team in a bad market. And, um, and they could afford me the time to get out there and make a few mistakes and figure out what I could really do well. And, and I remember one defining moment, uh, my rookie year, we were playing in, in Dallas and the, the Mavericks were just an expansion team at that point. And, uh, Frank Layden put me in the game in the second quarter and I blocked like six shots in five minutes. And I remember after one of them <laughs> I'm coming, turning around and starting to run back up the other end of the court. And I glanced over at the bench and the, and the assistant coaches and the head coach were all looking at each other and nodding at each other. Like, 
okay, this is this guy's got something going on. And it was at that moment that I knew I could hang, that I could that I could do something in the NBA, that I had a job, that I was a benefit to the team. And uh, so, um, a long-winded answer to your question, but no, 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 it's a, it's it's a, it's a great answer. And and here's the important part: just just to boil it down to a sentence, is you focused on the one thing that you were spectacular at. Uh, and, and whether you realize it at the moment, it took Will Chamberlain to point that out to you uh, or, or whoever, you know, uh, along the way, you know, gave you some advice, but you did it. Uh, you know, it's amazing to me how often I see people, you know, spreading themselves so thin and doing things that they're generally not good at. Uh, one of the things that I always think of myself as in, in running companies and, and, and what I do is I, I think of myself as a casting director of a high school play. Okay, your job is to do this, and your job is to do that, and your job, and I just, and everybody's got a part in the play, and and whether it's a, a a sporting event, whether it's a business, everything is is sort of like a play, and we just you know kind of all execute our parts, and and I so often see uh, you know people, and here's here's a common one. Okay, look, here's what I want you to do: uh, you're going to be doing secretarial functions in the morning, and you're going to be making sales calls in the afternoon, and and it just doesn't work. Because yeah. people are going to do the thing that they either like doing or is the least painful to them or one of the two jobs isn't getting done. And so right. by you focusing, it, it was awesome. Yeah, exactly. And everybody, everybody has a role in the team. And and, uh, and like you said, it's, it's pretty hard to split duties like that. People that are good at administration are not necessarily good at sales and vice versa. <laughs> Those are just two different personality traits. And so, and so the job of a coach, like you're talking about, is, is really to look at the strengths of each individual teammate and say, okay, this is the position you're going to play, and this is what you're going to do. And then I've got this guy over here that's going to do something. And if we all do our jobs well, and we acknowledge each other and honor each other in the process, that, um, you know, the, the result is going to be a win. And that's the greatest challenge in the NBA is to get five guys uh, go in the same direction at the same time, all with their respective strengths in order. And, um, and I think it's the same is true in business. We just, we just start assigning people jobs and this, that without any thought to, okay, who's the best person for this job or do I need to hire someone else or, uh, you know, is this person not positioned correctly? And, um, and I talk a lot about that in my presentation about, you know, finding your skill set your character traits and your skills that you already have and how can we better place them and, and, and utilize them in, in your business? You know, the one thing about sports that is so uh, terrific is that if somebody is marching in a different direction than everybody else, it's immediately obvious in sports. It's not always obvious in business that somebody has a hidden agenda or an alternative agenda or that they have something else that they're trying to accomplish. Uh, in sports, it's obvious. Uh, there, there's a scoreboard. The way we keep, uh, you know, you know, the way we keep care of things is uh, very clear. But one thing that more than anything, I talk a lot about business rules. The rules in sports are crystal clear. When you break the rules, there's a foul. Uh, it, you know, whatever, whatever you call it, whatever sport it is, uh, there are crystal clear rules, and you play by the rules. And every fan in the stadium knows what the rules are. The players know. In business, it's not always so clear. You find that? Yeah, I do. And I, and I think, yeah, like you mentioned in sports, you can look up at the scoreboard and see where you stand at any point in time. And, and in sports, if you lose two or three games in a row, you better have a team meeting because, you know, you could be living, <laughs> you could be living in a new city the next week. Um, and uh, so I, I, I see that a lot in business and people think, well, you just kind of go along and do their thing and don't want to rock the boat. And like, well, yeah, we'll address it at the next board meeting that's in six months from now. Um, and, and I think it, it drives a lot of frustration in the, in the workplace because people see that stuff going on. They see the infighting, the, the internal competition and such that really gets in the way of, of the business moving forward. And most of the business leaders I've found, they know where their business needs to go. They, need, they know what needs to be executed in order to make it work. It's really a matter of trying to get everybody on board with the same vision. And um, and so that's where spending more time developing the team, building the relationships between the team members is so critical. Uh, you know, that I was just looking on social media this summer, the, the, the Utah Jazz, who had a great season last year, made it to the second round of the playoffs. Uh, the guys on the team are hanging out with each other during the summer. 
And that was kind of a, a, a real aha for me. Like, wow, there's some real bonding going on here. They're not just guys doing their job, showing up, you know, punching the time clock. They really care about each other. And I'm not suggesting that you need to go out and hang out with all your employees or, uh, you know, take them all to dinner. But you do have to have an understanding of what makes them tick and be able to build those relationships so that the trust get, is there and the loyalty is there. Because um, if, if you're just trying to drive the engine all the time without any um, thought to the pieces that make the engine work, uh, you know, you're going to end up imploding at some point. You know, I, I, sort, of do, I sort of do think that uh, going out to dinner and socializing and bonding is really critical. I, I think it's really critical among teams. Uh, people need to uh, trust each other. They need to like each other as much as they can. Uh, because people tend to work harder for things that they like. They, they just do. And, and so well, I, I really I feel like they're a part of the process. You know, that's, that's the one thing I think that, that uh, is missing a lot is that, uh, well, I'm doing my job, but I don't, but there's no relationship that I don't see the relationship between what I'm doing and where we're going. And I think that's a, that's a big problem. One of the things I've liked in some of the more millennial oriented workplaces I've been in the past, uh, past year is that coming together of pulling everybody in saying, hey, look, here's where we are. Here's where we're going. Here's what's going on. Here's what you're doing. And they can more instantly see what the, uh, you know, where the, the bottom line is, where the goal is. And, um, and it keeps everybody, like you said, emotionally engaged in, in what's happening. And that's where the trust comes from because they're like, oh, I'm, I'm a part of something bigger. I'm making a difference. And I think that's, that's what, uh, especially the younger generation, uh, is. that's a very important factor of their, their work lifestyle. You know, one, one, of the things, one of the other things about um, sports that's so much easier than business is that the goal is clear. The goal is crystal clear. Our goal is to get to the playoffs. Our goal is to get to the World Series. Our goal is to get to the uh, whatever the thing is that, that you're shooting for. Uh, in business, it's not so easy to put your arms around the goals. And, and most of the time, the goals, uh, frequently they're put out by accountants. Okay, we need to uh, hit a million dollars more than last month or whatever. What I mean, a lot of times they're just arbitrary goals, whereas in sports, they're concrete, they're understandable. Uh, you understand exactly what steps you have to take to get to that goal. Uh, what can we learn from sports and how can we apply that to business? Any ideas? Uh, yeah, I think, first of all, the, the, it goes back to the coach um, that your job as a leader is to make sure that everybody understands the why of why they're there, why you're in business, what are you doing, what are you trying to achieve? Because without that, like you said, people just flounder, they wander around and they don't know exactly where they fit. And part of that, part of corporate America's challenge is, you know, there's been so many mergers and acquisitions the last, you know, umpteen years that the, the, the goal seems to be constantly moving. So the onus is really on the leadership team to come back and say, look, I, may, I need to make sure that everyone in my organization from the top down to the person who's the, the delivery driver or the bank teller, or whoever it is that's the new customer interface, uh, understands why we're here and what we're doing and believes in that vision and mission. If you go, if you go to entrepreneur events, you know, they're, they pound on that about making sure that your vision is clear, making sure your values are clear, making sure your mission is clear, because that's the only way you're going to keep everybody engaged as you grow. Because it's so easy to lose sight of that as investors come in and new money comes in and now we're going here and now we're doing there. And the people that are actually executing the, the tasks sometimes get lost um, in that whole conversation while the CEO is running around, you know, raising money or whatever it is he's doing. You know, you use the word vision. What's, what's the big vision, you know, for... Uh... For a basketball team, what's the vision like for the Jazz in the in the eighties? What was the vision? Do you remember? Um, yeah, you know, it, it it changed over time because when I first came to the team, we were a, a bad team, and and uh, and our coach said, "Look, you know, if, if we're not going to make the playoffs, we're going to affect the playoffs. We're going to start beating the better teams." And he challenged us to just get a little better. He said, "I'd rather lose the game by two points instead of three because two points is closer to winning." And it sounds kind of silly. But at the same time, he was trying to train us mentally to start thinking a little bit differently rather than just showing up and throwing up some shots and punching the time clock and going home. He said, look, I, I want you guys to start working with each other a little bit. And if you do, the individual accolades will show up. And, um, and so I, I think the vision at that point in time was to be more competitive. 
over time, the next year we win the division for the first time, we make the playoffs for the first time in team history, and then the vision shifted again to now we're not the doormat of the NBA anymore. Now we're a competitive team. Well, now I want to go from just a competitive team to being one of the better teams. And so they drafted a little bit differently. Um, we picked up a couple of other key players, and the, and we started this run of making the playoffs every year in a successful season year after year after year. So that consistency became so important to build a stable of players that worked well with each other, that, that uh, were competitive, and that were continually challenged to get to the next level. It wasn't We didn't put a team together and say, hey, next year we're going to win an NBA championship. They knew it was a building process that was going to take time. Um, but it was not just we're going to get some bodies out here to fill some spots. It was we're going to be selective about who we want uh, because we're trying to build something that's going to grow. And I think that's that was the vision, uh, to be competitive, to be consistent, and to constantly challenge. Um, but, uh, but not, you know, not just in one fell swoop. It was a, it was a process. That's, that's, um, that's really, it's awesome. And, and I just, I can only think about business, but, uh, you know, first we're going to, you know, losing by uh, 10 points is better than losing by 20. That, that alone is a significant way of thinking that, that right. the, the, the amount of loss is, is important and then getting better and watching it happen and, and kind of like stretching the team and making the goals a little bigger uh, I think that most companies do not have uh, any vision at all. I mean, I, I mean, you know, listen, uh, being in venture capital for many years, uh, there isn't a day goes by somebody doesn't call and ask me for money, not a single day. And, and I'll ask people to, you know, tell me what they're doing. And I can tell in 30 seconds uh, if they're clear, if they've got vision, if they understand what they're doing when they get up in the morning, if they understand why. I can tell uh, by listening to their voice if they're going to be able to deal with conflict as it comes along because they're that clear about what they're doing and where they're going. Uh, and I just, I just love that metaphor about sports, that it is so clear. Uh, sports is hard. It's really hard. But what's easy about it is the rules are so clear that, right. you know, that everybody plays by the same exact rules. They're all measured the same way. The stats are kept the same on every person. And those are things that are great about it. And it's, uh, it, that doesn't exist exactly exist in sports the same way. I, I mean, in business the same way. Right. Although I'm going to submit to you that there are still fundamentals of business that you have to follow in order to be successful. Like certain things have to happen. And so I think there's sometimes when you're talking to the venture capitalists, whatever, it's, it's, it's easy to get off track of, of, well, what is it that makes your company great? And are you spending more time doing that? Or are you spending more too much time trying to, you know, take it in some different direction. And, and so when I listen to business guys speak, I always, I always think back to like, you're talking about that one trick, like, okay, what is that one thing that you guys are doing that's, that's differentiating yourself from everybody else? How focused are you on building that? I think sometimes people get ahead of themselves, like, well, we need more funding. We need more of this. Like, okay, well, at the same time, what about more sales um, or something other that, that's, that's something they already do? Um, that has to be a part of that conversation uh, because I think that's that's sometimes where people get off track. They get too wrapped up in the you know the next round. Yeah. Well, listen. You know, the thing is that uh, in business, there's a hundred different things that uh, people need to do. They don't always know what the priority is. They don't always know what uh, what to spend the most time on or, or where to where to continue to put their energy. So uh, it's it's just difficult and. I'm not saying it's any easier in sports because it's not because listening to your experience with your coaches, uh, they kind of took you through a progression and there were some obviously great coaches in your career and maybe there were some not so great ones. And the great ones, uh, you know, the stories you're telling are, are just, they're magnificent because uh, they kind of walk you through a progression and kind of take you eventually to a place where you're going upstairs and it works out. So, um, hey, listen, uh, why don't you tell us any, any, uh, any speaking engagements coming up or anything great happening in your life you want to share? Uh my business is rocking and rolling right now. I have, I have nine speaking engagements in September and uh, I'm leaving for Maine tomorrow. We're going to spend Labor Day in Maine and uh, that's going to be fun. Um, you know, I, I guess the one business principle I found is that is that uh, at least for our standpoint, um, you do have to spend a little money on on uh, marketing and advertising. Like it doesn't matter. I mean, you have to be good when you get there. There's no question about that. But I've found that uh, um, you do have to spend a little bit to get your face and your name out there a little bit more because half the battle is just people don't know what you do. And yeah. so that's been my, that's been my one 
aha from the last year and take away. Yeah, well, listen, that's so that's another one of the little tricks, you know, is that you got to be good when you get there, but you got to tell people that you're good before you get there. <laughs> exactly. yeah. Yeah. Right. And you need some verification of that. Yes. All right. Well, listen, Mark. Hey, man, thank you very much. It's just been a pleasure to uh, spend a little time. Thanks for sharing with my audience. Uh, you want to just uh, give some contact info or we'll, we'll have it on the website, but you can share some info. Yeah. You can find me at seven foot four.com and um, or, you know, on any social media channel. And again, uh, uh, you know, I get out there and speak to a lot of different types of organizations. So well, fun. good. Well, listen, I hope next time you're in Southern California, we'll connect. Yes. Love to do that. All right, man. Listen, thank you very much. Uh, pleasure to have you. Thank you, Joel. Take care.